as below, so above. In order to remain a living community, the Brotherhood of Shambhala has to renew itself regularly with fresh forces. An organism that does not constantly regenerate dies. The Mahatmas require fresh blood from below. Today's members do not die. They have a right, however, that we should not ask for the sacrifice of their dwelling on earth for too long a time. That we allow them to move on to higher planets to continue their ascent there, for which it is high time according to their stage of development. A divine law forbids any one unit of a race to progress much further than the race to which he belongs. In other words, there is a certain minimum state of development which must be reached by all the normal units of the race before the single units can reach the highest state of that cycle. This is how Mahatma Hilarion speaks. I have told you that there is a present limit to my own evolution, that I must bring you to a certain point before I could go forward. This is only possible if some of us take their place. In order to allow older members to leave, the Mahatmas are urgently looking to include new candidates in their ranks. These must be willing and above all able to be trained to continue the great work. Who of you is up to this gigantic task. In every ashram there is always some disciple who is trained to eventually take the place of the master and thereby set him free for higher and more important work. Future Achats, completing their earthly accounts on the planet, are co-workers with us, the Achats. When hierarchy is enriched, there is a cosmic festival. However, Shambhala has the greatest difficulty in finding faithful, obedient and sufficiently advanced co-workers to fill vacant positions. Truly, there would be but little encouragement for those who must weigh and sift the wheat from the chaff, or must select the stones for the building of a temple from among a group of disciples. Were it not for the one here and there among third groups whose fidelity, humility, obedience and courage, like jewels set in a crown, shine out vividly, we would be most hopeless when the memory of the tremendous task is set for us. In those periods in which we are forced to review the varied remnants of our scattered flocks, those periods, sometimes referred to as eras of selection, when empty places are to be filled or broken lines are to be reformed. There is a story about a devil encountering an angel. The angel said, Thy servants are bitter. But the devil replied, 
Mine are bitter, thine are sour. We both must look for sweet ones. And the angel was crestfallen, for he could not prove that they had not turned sour. We are now coming to a point that is crucial for a new understanding of the world. We had said in the broadcasting, how do you find your teacher? The spiritual path only becomes concrete if you decide to look for a teacher and follow him. If you think more deeply and take the term succession really seriously, you understand that one day you have to reach the level on which you can take over as successor the position of your teacher. To be a Christian or a Buddhist means to walk the path that leads to the cosmic office of a Christ or a Buddha. Every holder of an office in politics, business and society at some point in time naturally looks for a successor. If you want to be a co-worker of the Brotherhood, you too one day have to become qualified and ready to take over an office in the international world government. Like Conway in the novel the Lost Horizon, we as well must set about to take over the legacy of Shambhala. When Jesus will pass on to take up a higher mission, perhaps upon some other planet, its labors will fall upon the ego which comes next in development. That seems to me once again quite soaring and far away from the concept of life of an ordinary person like me. Yes, this is a complete revolution in the old thinking. Who of the faithful has ever considered regarding himself as a coming Buddha or Christ? The new immortal man, however, is on the path to God. Thereon, the position of a world leader is only an intermediary stage. But let us start from scratch. First, assume an office at the bottom. Everywhere, in everyday life, you can take over and fill out in the spirit of the hierarchy a position that simply has to be occupied so that life on this planet can go on. Imagine in your spiritual world you have your workplace in room number 313 on the third floor, that means quite far down, of the headquarters of the world government. Your brothers and sisters in spirit, your co-workers, superiors and subordinates are working next to, above and below you. For the time being, you are only a small cogwheel in the global mechanism of the hierarchy. But you hold an office there, even if you are only working in a kindergarten in the material world. You are embedded in the supra-temporal community of those who are responsible for this planet. You implement their goals at your place. You participate in the dignity of the world government and can rise to higher positions over the years. The Mahatmas remain on earth for our support. They continue to share our life on this 
underdeveloped planet. Many workers remain in the earthly spheres so that they can continue working amidst all calamities. Although they have long since earned the right to live in higher, more pleasant worlds. The teacher has earned the right to separate himself from earth, but he chooses not to do so. We have not left, but have voluntarily remained on earth. We have consciously accepted earthly life. We could be far away, but choose to remain with the suffering ones. Every teacher in his past lives had to decide whether he wished to depart to the far-off worlds or remain with long-suffering earth. No little co-measurement was required for this decision, and each chose to remain with those who suffer. However, our elder brothers will only continue to work together with us as long as they can hope that the evolution on earth will actually advance. The great helpers of humanity do not abandon the earth so long as sufferings go unhealed. Everywhere in cosmos the principle of goal fitness applies. This means, just as we ourselves give up the hope of improving a mischievous donkey or a stubborn dog one day, the Brotherhood would turn away from us if there were no longer any chance that we learn our lesson in the foreseeable future. Their powers are limited too. In the interest of a more rewarding application of their efforts, they would then have to turn to other civilizations on other planets that are more receptive to their instructions and goals. The great teachers will accept the voluntary rejection by humanity of the higher knowledge, in which case they would apply their knowledge and energies for the benefit of other humanities on other planets. Like a builder, we summon co-workers, but we leave him who is not in need of our boat to cross the ocean even if it be on a bamboo stick. And what then will happen to us? Humanity would fall back into darkness for a long time, until one day through refined behavior, we deserve a new opportunity to be taught and guided by beings of a higher order. Decades may pass before the process of self-devouring becomes evident, but it grows from the very hour that hierarchy is denied. One must point out that if the guiding hand is not accepted, catastrophe is inevitable. Cosmic magnetism combats the diverting force. Those races which have strayed from the path of evolution 
were thus drawn into dissipation. The course taken by a race is determined by the correlation with the cosmic magnet, the acceptance of or resistance to the destined. Let us see to it that it does not come to that. Let us not behave like stubborn donkeys. Let us recognize the hierarchic principle. Let us confidently submit to the world government. Let us carry out their instructions and put our lives at their service. This is only to our own immeasurable benefit. At certain definite periods, such knowledge as is requisite for the erases in manifestation during said periods is given out by the initiates. If the race will not accept and heed the information given, it must bear the results of its indifference or willfulness. A perfect stream of such knowledge and information has been poured out on the humanity of this age within the last half century. In isolated cases it is appreciated and utilized, but the worldwide enthusiasm and effort, the impulse, the wave of ardent endeavor which should rise and swell to such a height as to overwhelm the error supineness and self-satisfaction of those to whom that knowledge has been given have hardly started, and time is flying. Where is the man who will speak the word, or write the treatise, that will lift the life-wave of enthusiastic effort into motion?